Okay, students, um, in this video we're going to talk about, uh, this is our first video about the greenhouse effect, um, which is a major, major issue um, currently in the world. You've probably heard a lot about the greenhouse effect and um, about global warming and climate change and so forth, and that's what we're going to study in this class. But before we really talk about the science behind the greenhouse effect, we have to spend some time talking about um, solar radiation and sunlight and the energy that comes from sunlight and albedo and so forth, okay? Um, I just want to remind you guys that very obviously the sun is shining all the time and it radiates in all directions in a spherical fashion through space, okay? It turns out that the sun radiates um, a lot of energy, okay? It gives off um, 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts of power um, in all directions all, of, all the time. So, of course, sunlight on Earth looks like this. Sunlight on Mars looks like this. It's a little bit dimmer because Mars is, far, uh, is uh, further away. Um, what the sun looks like on Pluto is essentially a very faint star. Okay, It's very cold on Pluto. So um, in all of these conversations that we have about solar radiation and the effect of the sun and so forth, I want you to keep in mind how important the sun is in terms of all life processes and virtually everything on Earth. The importance of the sun cannot be understated, okay, or overstated, that is, okay? Now, just to remind you guys about kind of the, the model of the sun, the surface of the sun is only about 6,000 Kelvin, okay? I say only, that's pretty hot, but it's not a hot, it's not um, hot enough for nuclear um, fusion to take place. And you know that the sun, again, is a natural uh, fusion reactor, okay, uh, with mostly hydrogen and helium inside of it. Now, the core is so hot that it's plasma. The temperature of the core is about 15 times 10 to the 6 Kelvin. It's quite a bit hotter than, the sur than, the, than its surface, um, and that's where the fusion takes place, okay? So the solar energy spreads out in space spherically as a sphere. So um, if you imagine um, the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth, for example, it would be uh, the amount of solar radiation going through a spherical shell with the radius of uh, radius of that shell being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, so the energy um, at the ground level and the Earth at the zenith when the Sun is directly overhead depends on the distance to the Sun. It actually um, depends on a lot of things in terms of how much, um, in terms of how much um, solar insulation, which is radiation, uh, is actually absorbed, okay? But the time of the year is important. It turns out that um, in January, the sun and the distance between the sun and the earth is less, and that's called perihelion, and it's about 3.3% higher. It's about 3.3% lower in July, which is aphelion, um, because in July, the sun is actually uh, farther from the earth. Now, a lot of people in the northern hem hemisphere think that it's just the opposite, right? Because, oh, it's hot in July, so we must be closer to the sun. But actually, the distance to the sun, as you can see, makes very little difference in terms of the actual amount of solar insulation that's absorbed by the earth, okay? And there are, I just want to remind you, there are two common ways of using the sun's energy. We can either heat something or to make electricity. And you see all these solar cells, uh, voltaic cells on top of these rooftops, okay? So solar energy is kind of a big sort of up-and-coming sort of, of clean energy source that you guys have already learned about, okay? Okay, now if the sun radiates 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts in all directions, all the time, and the intensity is power per meter squared, and it turns out that at, then at the Earth, um, the power, the intensity of, of uh, solar radiation is about 1,380 watts per square meter, and here's the spherical shell that I was telling you about. This is the area of the spherical shell for which the radius is the distance, be average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Now, the amount reaching the surface of the Earth depends on how much atmosphere it has to travel through. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So, for example, this is why it's cooler at night, and especially when as the day gets on, like towards sunset, it gets cooler because the sun goes uh, is, is lower in the sky and it has to pass through more atmosphere so therefore the intensity of that radiation is less because more of it is absorbed by the added atmosphere that it goes through. Now the average over a 24-hour period reaching the surface is about 340 watts per square meter okay and about a thousand watts per square meter actually makes it to the surface assuming the Sun is overhead on a sunny day and I'll talk a little bit more about about why that is okay now here's some data for, for the planets in our solar system it's a really interesting data you can pause the video and take a look we're gonna actually use some of this data to find out about the intensity of sunlight on, uh, on, a, on a couple other planets in the next slide okay 
All right. <clears throat> okay, so example one, calculate for Mercury, Jupiter, and Neptune the intensity of the sun's radiation on the planet's surface, and two, the total amount of energy the circular disk of the planet receives from the sun in one Earth hour. Go ahead and try this one on your own. Okay, so intensity is power per unit area. For Mercury, Jupiter, and Neptune, I got these values. So the only difference between these um, is the actual radius that you're using of that spherical shell because the radius is the average distance of, the, of that planet from the, uh, from the sun. Now, the total amount of energy the circular disk of the planet receives from the sun in one Earth hour is going to depend on more than that because the, the planets are different sizes, of course. Okay, um, So in this case, you're going to actually use the radius of the planet, not the radius of the orbit. Okay. Uh, the total energy is the intensity times area of the disk times time. For Mercury, I got 6.23 times 10 to the 20th. Okay. Uh, for Jupiter, a little bit more, and Neptune, a little bit less. So you see that the size of the planet, the size of the circular collector, if you will, the circular disk, makes a, makes a big difference here. Now, for the Earth, um, the total amount of energy the planet receives from the sun in one Earth hour, and this is not taking into account clouds or, or any other atmospheric conditions or water or land or anything like that. It's about 6.38 times 10 to the 20 joules. So that's a lot of energy that could be harnessed to do really useful things. Um, and that's why the solar energy industry is such an up-and-coming big thing uh, for the future, hopefully. Okay? All right. So you just want to go through kind of the, geog the, um, the geometry of how the Earth goes around the sun. And just to remind you guys of a few things, you know what causes the, the seasons. Uh, the seasons are caused by the Earth being tilted on its axis by 23 and a half degrees. I hope you learned that in, in a geography course at some point. Now, I want to point out that the amount of solar energy absorbed by Earth's surface depends on, on several things. Number one, the angle at which the sun hits, okay? And the angle at which the sun hits can depend on a couple of things, the time of the time of day, obviously, but it also depends on the season, okay? So, for example, the Earth is tilted on its axis, as I alluded to before. Okay, here's the axis right here. This angle right here would be the 23 and a half degrees. Um, and so... This particular situation would correspond to um, would correspond to winter in the northern hemisphere, which would be January. Okay, so you can see that solar radiation is more directly incident upon the southern hemisphere. It comes in on the northern hemisphere at more of an angle. Therefore, it tends to be cooler um, in the northern hemisphere at that time of year. But I hopefully hopefully you guys know that already. All right, now. Turns out that the color of the surface is important, and this is a concept called albedo, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. So, a dark surface absorbs more solar energy than a, than a light or a shiny surface. Okay, the output of the sun turns out that the solar output changes by about 1.5 percent over over time, and that's due to prominences and flares and sunspots and that sort of thing. And of course, what we've already talked about, the distance from the sun, uh, which we saw is about plus or minus 7%, depending on the time of year between aphelion and perihelion. Okay, now, if we look at the solar insulation, when I say insulation, I'm talking about the incoming solar radiation. Okay, so insulation um, for different months out of the year, for two different latitudes, okay, you get a curve that looks like this. Now, I guess uh, my question to you is, um, for two different latitudes, which would be the higher latitude? That is to say, which of these curves would correspond to a, uh, a higher latitude further north, and which would correspond to a lower latitude uh, closer to the equator? What do you think? Turns out that the bottom one is the one that the one that has more extreme variation is the higher latitude one. So you can see that in December, uh, January, November, the amount of solar insulation per day is very low. Okay, but it's quite it's a lot higher, obviously, in the summertime, right? Um, but it never achieves the levels that it does at the equator because the sun never shines quite that directly on, the, on those high latitudes. So there's less, less of a variation at the equator. And you see that in a lot of situations uh, in terms of the weather and a lot of other environmental phenomena. There's less variation near the equator than there are at the poles, near the poles or higher latitudes. Okay. And I just want to remind you that land heats up faster than water, though they both absorb the same amount of energy, and this can be seen by clouds forming over land, but not over water. We've talked about that a lot when we talked about thermal physics already and the specific heat capacity of land versus the specific heat capacity of water. Okay? Okay. So just to reiterate the importance of the angle of the sun on absorbed radiation, we have a beam of sunlight, okay, and I know we're not using SI units here, we're using miles, uh, but that's okay. 
um, if we have a beam of sunlight that's one mile wide, if it's if it's incident normally incident upon the surface of the Earth, okay, then the width of the beam would be one mile. If it's coming in, it turns out at 30 degrees, for example. Notice how that energy is now spread out over twice the area. Okay, so clearly we have the same amount of energy, but it's spread over twice the area. It will be much less intense. That's why the intensity of sunlight varies. Um, with the angle at which the at, between the surface of the Earth and the and the beam itself. Okay, now a couple of other interesting graphics that I've gotten off of Wikipedia. Um, here's one showing the annual mean insulation at the top of the Earth's atmosphere here, and at the planet's surface. So what does this tell you? Well, this tells you that. Uh, basically, it well, it tells you a lot of things. It tells you where it's most cloudy, for example. Okay, um, at the planet's surface, you're going to have less uh, solar insulation, less energy absorbed, le less intense sunlight. Okay, so for example, the Sahara Desert's quite quite high. All right, um, these cloudy areas like the Pacific Northwest is quite quite low, and so forth. It also tells you about. Um, uh, it also indicates albedo of the surface, how shiny or dark uh, the surface is. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then here's a really cool map of the global solar potential around the world. So um, again, taking into account things like um, cloudiness, weather patterns, and so forth. So you can see that there's a lot of solar potential in the western coast of South America, southwest United States, Mexico, most of Africa, and Australia, okay? In cloudy places like, you know, Siberia and Europe and Canada, um, there's, there's, there's less sort of solar potential. So if you're thinking about, you know, if you want to get a Nobel Prize, uh, in science, um, what you want to do is kind of crack the crack the code of how to make the, a solar energy uh, acquisition sort of a commonplace um, occurrence because because really it's a great clean energy energy source and there's tons of energy to be had as we know. Don't forget how important the sun is and virtually everything on Earth and all the history of the Earth and everything that's ever happened on the Earth can really de really depends on the sun. Okay, all right. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about albedo to round out this lecture, okay? Uh, just to remind you, when the sun's radiation hits the Earth, the following things can happen. Number one, the radiation can be, can be reflected back to space. Number two, it can be absorbed by the atmosphere. Or number three, it can pass through the atmosphere and is incident upon the surface. Now, once it gets on the surface in case three, the radiation can do one of two things. It can be absorbed or reflected. So the type of the surface is important, which I've alluded to before anyway. Okay, This term albedo, uh, the symbol for albedo is alpha. It's the ratio of reflected to incident um, incoming solar radiation. Okay, um, So in other words, it's the total scattered or reflected power over the total incident power. And it should kind of remind you a little bit of efficiency in that sense of a ratio. There are no units to albedo, okay? So for example, um, oceans, because they absorb a lot of solar energy because of their color, um, they tend to have a low albedo. Clouds and ice, like if you look at this um, picture of the Earth, you can see that the, sh that the white parts, the parts that are really bright where you need your sunglasses, right, like snow-covered surfaces and clouds tend to have a high albedo because you have a high, re high reflectivity in those cases. Now I should also point out that the angle at which the sun strikes the ocean has a great impact on its albedo. The lower the angle, the higher the albedo. The higher the angle, uh, the lower the albedo. Okay, so all the lots of different factors. It's somewhat complicated. Okay, now albedo is obviously only relevant for objects that reflect radiation. So in astrophysics, which we'll study uh, eventually, albedo. The albedo of an extraterrestrial object can tell us a lot about the surface of an object. So, for example, comets. How do we know what comets are made of? Well, now we know what comets are made of because we've landed the Rosetta spacecraft and all this kind of thing, right? But here's the picture of the Rosetta spacecraft recently uh, in 2014, a photo of Comet 67B. Comets are made mostly of ice, okay? And they're very shiny. So we can look at distant planets and um, all kinds of things, and we can infer what their surfaces are like just by observing their albedo. It's pretty cool stuff, okay? So here's some albedos of different terrestrial surfaces. So you can see that snow and clouds have relatively high albedos. Water, forest, meadows, crops, and soil, they tend to be quite low, okay? And look at the different kinds of clouds also have different kinds of albedos. You should be aware, you don't have to memorize all these numbers, but you should be generally aware of the following. 
The albedo for snow can be up to 0.85. The albedo for dark forest is down around, uh, around 10%. And for Earth, overall, including its atmosphere as a whole, the albedo is about point as about 30 percent, 0.3. Okay. Now, low albedo surfaces tend to get hot because they absorb most solar radiation, and also albedos vary throughout time for different parts of the Earth on a daily scale, seasonal scale, meteorological, weather, and, and climatological. Think ice ages and so forth. Okay. So here's a really cool image of the total sky albedo and the clear sky albedo. Uh, for 2003 and 2004, okay? So um, so this is taken over, this is average over the course of the year. Total sky albedo tells you what's going on with clouds and so forth. Pretty interesting stuff, okay? You probably, hopefully there's, you can infer some links between what you're seeing in this video and what you've seen in geography if you're taking geography, okay? Now, the solar constant in the outer atmosphere is about 1400 watts per square meter, okay? At any moment, the Earth's disk area pi r squared, it turns out that the disk area is one-fourth the total area of the sphere, and that's where this equation comes from, pi r squared, right? Because think about it, the sphere, it's bulging out, so the half of what you see is actually about one-quarter of, it is actually one-quarter of the total surface area of a sphere. So the power of radiation received per meter squared over the Earth's total surface um, is about 345 watts per square meter, okay? And this is an amazing picture taken from the International Space Station, again showing um, the effect of clouds on um, insulation on the surface, and also the angle of the sun on the ocean. You can see there's a high albedo here, but only in that part, okay? So it's somewhat on the other side of the Earth where the sun is incident, is normally incident on the surface of the water, the albedo would be quite a bit lower. Same sun, same ocean, right? Okay. Now, since about 30% is reflected, the Earth receives a net radiation intensity of about 242 watts per square meter. Okay. And remember that albedos can vary throughout time for different parts of the Earth on several different scales, seasonal, daily, weather-related, and long-term climatological um, ways.